The intro video was the logo for the human perspective, with a photo of Judy Human in the middle with orange and purple concentric circles swirling around it. This video is a video interview between Judy Human, Lionel J. Woodyard, Denise Jacobson, and Ann Capola Freeman. Judy Human is a white disabled woman with chin length brown hair. She uses a wheelchair and is wearing a dark blue shirt and glasses and is in the entryway of her apartment with many pictures behind her. Lionel is a black man with gray hair and a beard. He is wearing a collared shirt and glasses and is in a room with a blank wall behind him. Anne is a white woman of short stature. She has ear length white hair and is wearing a patterned collared shirt and glasses. She is in a room with bookcases behind her. Denise is a white disabled woman with short gray hair. She uses a wheelchair and is wearing a floral collared shirt, glasses, and is in a room with a poster of Crip Camp behind her. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Human Perspective. Today, we are going to have, I hope, a really interesting program. Uh, Becca and I decided that we thought it'd be a great idea for people to meet some of the people who were involved in Crip Camp. And so we selected three people that we think will give you their personal perspectives on what Jeanette meant to them at that point and how their lives have moved forward. And so I kind of randomly, uh, when Lionel came onto the screen earlier, he had his wife with him. And I thought it'd be really nice that we could have them both introduce themselves. And same for Sam and Anne, Anne who will be speaking with us, Sam, the husband, and Neil, Denise's husband, and Jorge, my husband, are actually both taking naps at this point. So sorry, they're not gonna be on the screen. What I'm hoping to do today is to really make this a friendly, funny discussion that also has a knowledge that is shared about the importance of disabled people being able to gather together and for allies, which I think we'll see is a very important role that Lionel and others have played. So maybe we could start out with you, Lionel. Could you give us a really brief overview of who you are and introduce your wife? Yes, I'm Lionel J. Woodyard. I'm from Mobile, Alabama. I uh, was able to uh, participate, I'll uh, be a part of Camp Jeanette as a result of answering a, a, a poster at my college. It said summer job, which I didn't have a possibility of in Mobile, Alabama. Camps, I was a Boy Scout and had worked at a camp, but the sale was New York. I had never been out of the border states. So going to New York was a, like going to the moon. So I, I immediately uh, applied and was hired, invited my best friend and two other people. And in fact, there were six of us from Mobile, Alabama with Mr. G, Eugene Morgan, who uh, came up to Jeanette in 1970. Um, I live in Atlanta with my wife of 35 years, Cheryl Diane Williams, Woodyard now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have one son, Terrence Maurice, and we have six granddaughters. Wow. Cheryl? Cheryl, introduce yourself. So happy to have you with us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm Cheryl Woodyard, and as you said, I'm originally, we've been together 35 years. I am originally from Oklahoma City. Oklahoma, and I met Lionel here and um, did a journey, but I can say that coming from Oklahoma and then him coming from Alabama, I have learned even more about the South and some of the things, his experiences that he went through compared to what I went through. So it's, it's been um, educational for me as well, and then watching the Crip Camp is just another layer of education for me. So I've been uh, glad to be a part of this myself, indirectly through Lionel. Did Lionel talk to you a lot over your 39 years about Jeanette? Yes. Oh, yes. I've learned a lot. He's told me a lot about Jeanette. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank All you. right. Anne. Yes. Give us a very brief overview of who you are and then introduce um, your husband. Okay. So I'm living in Albany, California right now, which is right next to Berkeley. And however, I am from Queens, New York, where I met Judy way back when. I've been here since I'm 23. I met Sam 29 years ago. Really? 
Yes. It, we're having our 25th wedding anniversary. No way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. On the 21st, unless I'm screwed up the math. Nope, that's it. And let's see. So when I came here, I, I worked at the Center for Independent Living, went and got a master's at UC Berkeley in social welfare, um, was a hospital social worker uh, for many years, retired. And now I do some work um, uh, with the Center for Accessible Technology. Sam? I'm Sam Freeman, Anne's husband. Um, what can I say? We, Anne and I took very different paths out here, but we met out here in San Francisco. Um, I'm also from the East Coast, not far from where Anne was, I was in New Jersey. Uh, and what can I say? We, Met, we fell in love. Here we are. Um, so, Sam, let me ask you a question, like I just asked Cheryl, and that is, um, did you learn about Jeanette uh, before the film was being made from Anne? Um, no, I learned about it before that. Before the film was being made. But before the film was being made. Uh-huh. Because How did Anne speak about it. Yeah. Because um we had a a, mu aunt, a mutual friend who had his oh. wife had a video uh of that, of a clip from that would that was done by the filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Um and that clip was called quote the crab epidemic at Camp Jeanette. Mm -hmm. And seeing that film. Um, and told me about her experience in mm -hmm. Jeanette. And that was Ale Alec Levy's wife. Uh, After Alec had passed away, mm -hmm. she said, I have this film, this little bit clip that Al Al's in. Do you want it? So yeah, that's when I told him about it. All right. And Denise, um, you're not going to introduce your husband, but <laughs> <laughs> introduce yourself. Um, my husband is in back of me as a sister, but I grew up in the Bronx, New York. Um, I came out to California. 42 years ago <laughs> to be in the UCSF Sex and Disability Peer Counseling Program. It was a year. Training program. I already have my masters, and I came out, and we were supposed to train for a year, and then go back to where we came from and start working in the field. Only I came in here and I was homesick for about two weeks. And then I decided this is my home and I stayed. So you had your master's from NYU in what? You mean sexuality, marriage, and family life. Education. Did you ever complete the program that you started at UCSF? Um, yes. I, I, um, 
больше не Okay, so we got three of you in California is where two of you moved and Lionel moved to Atlanta. So let's talk a couple of minutes about Jeanette and uh, we can get back to California and work that you were doing there both. But Lionel, so as Cheryl was saying and you were explaining, you went from Mobile, Alabama to Camp mm -hmm. Jeanette. Yes. You know much about it in advance? I didn't even know anything. All I knew, <laughs> Dean, Eugene Morgan, who had been uh, going up to the camp to work since 1958, from, I might have a day of year two wrong, but he started working there in 1958 from Mobile. Uh, Mr. Eugene Morgan, I say Mr. Then, I can call him Eugene now, <laughs> um, was a teacher, high school teacher in Mobile. And he put the sign up at my school. The only thing that I was interested in was that summer job at a camp in New York. What the camp was about, I had no clue. And you didn't care. Well, I think that, you know, sometimes I, I try to think back if he said that it was for handicapped kids and adults, whether that would have even resonated with me as to what that would have been. Because I never ever identified with anyone in a wheelchair to being handicapped. And the only person that I knew in a wheelchair was my grandmother. She had arthritis and she didn't always require a wheelchair, but this guy named Arthur, see, that's what old people call arthritis, used to really beat her up. And I was mad with this guy, Arthur. But the arthritis took her ability to walk and they put her in a wheelchair. She, she still did everything that she did before. She still cooked. She still, she still made the best sweet potato pies on earth. Uh, she had a hot dog stand next to her house and she still worked that. And above all, she still would tear my love behind up if I did something wrong. She just couldn't run after me. The, the, and, let me just, and I know I'm long, but my, they put a ramp up at the church because she was a, a very significant part of the AME church that I attended. But no one connected the word handicapped to my grandmother. Mm -hmm. So if Jean did, in fact, say it was for handicapped kids and adults, I would not have identified with that word. And I think for the audience, uh, you can tell our ages because the word handicap was the word that was still being used in the 60s, actually didn't really, really die out until 80s and maybe even a little bit in the 90s. Um, so I think that's just an FYI for people. And mm -hmm. so when you got to camp, Lionel, and there were many kids and they all had different disabilities, what was your first reaction? Well, before the kids got there, uh, the first person that I met was a, someone we did, that we all loved was Paul Goodman. And when when the, 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 the guys from Alabama, there were six of us African-Americans who came up from Alabama. And it was the first time that I had been in a culturally and ethnically diverse setting with acceptance, with acceptance. That's a very important part of what I'm saying. The very first person to shake my hand was someone in fact with the disability and that was Paul Goodman. He, he had his little hand out and he had a birth defect. I think that's what you would say. And he shook my hand. He didn't hide that. He put it right out there and I shook it. And, and I think uh, soon after that, there might've been one or two other people that were on staff in wheelchairs and I said, hmm. So when the kids got up there, uh, they didn't come up to the camp. We went and picked them up. 
in at, New York City. At the, at the Federation for the Blind at 7th Avenue and 14th Street. That's where the bus showed up. And I, I have to say that this experience really kicked off when we picked the kids up because you saw all of these kids in wheelchairs and, and okay, what are we going to do? We're going to do what everybody else would do with kids, have some fun. We had already trained as to how to pick someone up out of their wheelchair because then you had to take them out of the wheelchair and take them on the bus, fold the wheelchair and put it on the truck. Right. So I, I was just happy to be a part of the helping at that time and getting to understand what we were doing. So I know um, the first summer you were there, you were there for eight weeks. Yes. So if you could just quickly reminisce from the first day you got there till the end of the eighth week and how you think that experience changed you the first summer. The experience changed me or enhanced me. I think we're all the, per the, the who we are is already there. And sometimes experiences in life bring out who you are or who you're supposed to be in life. That experience first gave me a freedom that I had not known back in Alabama. I worked at a Boy Scout camp three summers prior to Jeanette. That's why the camp experience was there. The difference is I was an Eagle Scout and taught swimming and camp, camping mirror badge at the before camp uh, Boy Scouts were integrated. See, the Boy Scouts had to integrate because United Way wasn't going to fund them anymore. They made one big camp for all of the Boy Scouts to come to. Because I was an Eagle Scout, I was hired to work there. My job at the Black Boy Scout camp before integration was swimming and teaching camping. When I got to the newly integrated camp, my job was commissary dishwasher. I was not allowed to interact with the Boy Scouts there as a swimming instructor and or teach their mom. Camping mirror badge. When but you I got Ned, and the job that I was assigned was counselor and swimming instructor. And that's what I did. So how yeah. did you how did you change if you did? I, I don't use the word change, but how did Jeanette influence you as a person uh, spending eight weeks with disabled campers? Disabled campers, we when you had Jeanette, you became a family. When you are a counselor, you have a bump that is a more nucleus, nucleus of a family. So my bump was B1. We identified, we even changed the name from B1. That was what the, cow, the camp called us. We were BB1, Boss Brothers 1. And I still, 51 years later, can still remember Clipper, Clifford Siegel, Right. Calvin Brothers, right. Kevin White, uh, Emma Crimmins, Jim Lebrecht, Scott Menthol, Carrie Walker. Yes. Yeah. A few. So, so the camp was, the whole camp was a family. But then when you worked in your bunk, you were a more, more complete nucleus family of a family, so to speak. Uh, Paul Goodman worked in the bunk with me, Steve Hollinsbaum, a deaf kid that taught me sign language, uh, John McCormick, and another deaf kid that I can't remember his name. But it was, it, was, it was just like being at home, away from home. We were family, and no one looked at you different. They looked at you as a part. Thank you. Denise, why did you go to Camp Jeanette? Yeah. I was 16 years old. Had you gone to any other camps before Jeanette? Yes. I went to quite a 
you and it wouldn't have been a good friend through the tankies. Do you remember which camp that was? Oh, and at that time, a lot of the camps would kick us out when we reached a certain age. And in Oakhurst, it was 14 years old. We said we couldn't go back. We said I skipped a summer and freedom went to Finland. And, and I went on a team tour for disabled teens. It was three weeks. And so I got, I got out of going to camp. I didn't really like going to camp. Why? Well, I didn't like leaving home, number one. Number two is it, it was a struggle at the beginning to fit in. Because having seen people in a speech and planning, people always assume I was cognitively disabled. So every time I went to camp, I, I can't prove that I, I can prove who I was, that I was more, that I was funny. So, and the year I went to Jenland, I had no choice. My mother had died that year in October, and my dad and my sister worked all day and didn't want me to be stuck in the apartment or summer. It was up two flights of stairs. And I was okay with that. I oh, I can read, I can write soap operas. I was just uh, occupying myself. But they say, now you have to go. So, in high school that year, I met Bobby and we, we became friends. Bobby, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Denise. Bobby, what? Bobby, it's in and Bobby had gone to dinner the summer before he seemed to see the food that had been bunked against and it looked like if I was 
coming to Jane, I would be in the boat, but I might keep eating you. I, I am eating that I couldn't want that for or that fish on my crutches is well nicer or you can use a wheelchair and let me say oh okay but that means you can't be in the embodies band because there's not enough steps to breathe in Israel. They were gonna put me in the floor, which I there was a young bank and I was so disappointed and I thought, you know, it's the same old thing. They're going to put me with the babies even though I say there will be another girl with my age in our school. I thought he was giving me a crack. So you went to camp anyway, and did you like it? Well. <laughs> <laughs> so the first week again, I caught the eye of this guy named John Martin, who had a reputation. And at the beginning of the week, he was looking around for a girlfriend and he kind of smelled me. But then as the week wore on, he began to nourish me. And by the end of the week, we were a couple. A 16-year-old couple. Well, he was old. Was he 17? He was, he was 18. So I think another point that I just want to make here is at that time and now, non-disabled people were not attending camp when they were older than 15. Mm. Camp Oakhurst and others, where 14 was the cutoff, um, Jeanette was a place that people went to. Um, I think the Carolians too, no, Anne? Yeah, I think it was like 14, yeah. 13. One uh, girls, I think 14, or uh, well, yeah. Yeah, it was a cutoff. We didn't have it. Boys, boys were 14. Oh. Girls were 16. Denise has a great memory, as you can all see. She remembers a level of detail that I do not. I don't know if Anne would remember it, but I remember it when she says it. I don't remember being interviewed to go to Camp Jeanette, but I'm sure if Denise said it happened, it happened. So, Anne. Yes. How did you get to Camp Jeanette? Yes. Um, I, I too went to another camp. I went to Camp Corolla and, um, which was great. I mean, I had a really good time. I met wonderful people, um, that I became lifelong friends. 
Um, and then I guess because Denise remembers better than I, you know, there was a certain age when that was the end of it. Um, and then I got to Jeanette, um, a, a friend of mine who I was in school with, you know, in a special ed class with Ruthie. She um, she said, you know, we have we have friends who go to this camp, Jeanette. Why don't we try it? So we went. And um, I only went, I might have only gone four weeks. It was 1970. Maybe I went. I think they only had sessions for a month. Oh, yeah, a month. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't have two, two yeah. months. Yeah, it was a month. And um, I loved it. I mean, there were friends like I knew Nancy D'Angelo, I knew Val Ramona. I had briefly known Al Levy. Al Levy and I became very, very close at camp. And I still miss Al very much. Yes. Um, yeah, he was a character, as you could see in Grip Camp. Um, so Al is the guy who was. Um, just briefly describe who, who Al was in the in Crip Camp. Al was the guy who um, <laughs> talked about uh, okay smoking and itching your crotch. Right, and getting your 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 private parts washed mm -hmm. after the crab epidemic. <laughs> you know how humiliating that was for people who couldn't do it, and you know um, I hesitated because, like Sam mentioned, I did see a little longer version with Sam of the crab epidemic. So I was trying to remember what was in the crib camp and what was in that. Um, anyway, um, that was Al, you know, Grateful Dead. Why, would, why was Jan Jeanette meaningful to you? To me. Um, it, was, it was fun. And it was fun. And that's not a trivial, that wasn't a trivial feeling for me, you know, in a group. Why? Because, um, I was with people who were disabled. No one had my disability. And I was used to that at that time. What's your disability? I, I have a form of dwarfism called diastrophic dysplasia. Which means? Which means I am, <laughs> I grew to be three foot four. Um, I was able at, at Jeanette to stumble around a bit. Walking was always very painful, but that's what she did, you know, because it was good for you. And but when I got to high school, I started using a power chair. That was the only way they let me go to high school. Um, mm. So they said, you know, and my dad heard <laughs> about these motorized wheelchairs and his union. He was a uh, sanitation worker, um, bought it, that first chair and a power chair. And I was very, very lucky. Um, but I didn't bring it to Jeanette, don't I? I don't know why. So, but anyway, um, I was going to say, because I felt like I fit in, you know, um, I'm very used to even now, you know, once in a blue moon, this happens, but definitely growing up back then in the 60s and 70s, I just go outside and anybody who didn't know me, I was, I was constantly looking around and waiting for someone to make fun of me, um, laugh at me, point at me, whisper about me, that that was existed. That's what life was. That's it. Um, Did Jeanette make you a stronger place? Stronger? It made me stronger in terms of being comfortable to be around people who were not disabled, maybe. I was used to being around, maybe like you counselors right now. You know, I was, you know, we were the same age, you know, and I was around people who were my age who just talked to me and were with me like, like a, everyone else, you know, I didn't have to feel that they weren't going to be, you know, make little jokes about me. If they did, I didn't hear it. But I, I, um, I didn't, I didn't, I felt very accepted. I felt like I fit in. Um, I love the music of that era. I love that music. And that's why in the, in the, in the film, I'll say something about, you know, wanting to go to, you know, uh, Woodstock. I mean, that was, that was, you know, I love that era. I love, like, I envisioned myself as a hippie. Um, I, I felt very comfortable. Did it make me stronger? Made me more comfortable. As I even think about it, I was always around disabled people because of school and camp, camp and the cold. segregated classes. Always segregated classes like Judy and Denise. And I know what segregated 
means. Yes, you do. And, and to, to Ned, that all of those barriers that were outside of the camp didn't exist, you know, and 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 you were able to be comfortable in your own being, mm -hmm. you know, if you were brown, fine if you were blonde, fine if you were in a wheelchair, fine if you had crutches, fine. No one put you in any kind of category, and and there was no stratification of who was. Who were who was better, who was worse? We were all this family. I think that's what we had at Jeanette. We had this thing that made us all feel apart. That's why we all remember each other. I remember Denise at camp. I remember Amy. How can you forget Denise? No, no <laughs> one can forget Denise. I tell Denise's husband that I love his wife. Uh -huh. <laughs> hey, the king and the that was very striking is no way put limits on anybody else so freaking free I, in my life, I had, I got campus and scared asking me to help someone. Mm -hmm. Like, because I could stand up, I could reach. Things mm -hmm. so my, my other friends and we can't they needed someone they wouldn't think about asking a counselor who was across the box they would say Hey, can you that? Um, we did that for each other. Like, it's a human body and needed help. Um, I helped my friend Ray go to the bed. And I want her back. You saw he told me that I can do things that nobody at home thought I could do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I felt for myself that, um, like both of you, I all three of you, I'd gone to other, I'd only gone to one other camp, Camp Oakhurst. And I think both camps really were a value to me because I was with other people who had disabilities. I think this is an interesting issue to discuss. You know, on the one hand, we all very much believe uh, that disabled people and others need to be integrated into society. On the other hand, we all, really um, gain strength by being in these camps with other people who had disabilities, even though our disabilities were different. Um, for me, it was when I was at Jeanette, like an age appropriate issue. So I think maybe I went to Jeanette longer than either Anne or Denise. And I went there when I was in high school, I think maybe through my first year of college, or maybe my second and second and third year of high school and my first year of college before 1971. But what I really resonate to was being able to talk about issues that were, of course, having fun and dating and being attracted to people and all the things that other teenagers were discussing, mm -hmm. 
but I didn't necessarily get to discuss those things with my non-disabled friends because it just kind of didn't fit in um, and could do that at camp. But for me, it was also talking about my future and our futures. And, you know, when we were teenagers, others were beginning to talk about their futures at home, going to college, what were they interested in? So for me, Jeanette was really kind of a multifaceted place. You know, we got to be together with different people, have fun. But we also got to think about our future and barriers we were facing and solutions that we wanted to think about. Did any of you get in, do you resonate to what I just said? Yeah, I, I do. And I think um, it started for me even younger than Jadet, yeah. you know, because I met, you know, at Corolla and of course go to school with so many disabled people, other kids, we would talk. Um, and Jeanette, I kind of more saw like, I don't know, I think Al Levy influenced me a lot. I keep bringing, go back to him, you know, like what he did and him talk about the dad going to this and that. It's just like, oh, we could expect, you know, there's more in life than, I don't know, it just kind of expanded my mind, what other disabled people could do. I mean, when I went to school, when I went to Jeanette that one summer, I was already headed to Hofstra University the fall and I already picked the major, you know? So mm -hmm. I was kind of like, by the time I got to Jeanette, things were starting to gel, you know? I didn't know how I would live on my own or whatever. I already had a boyfriend back home already, you know? So things were kind of gelling. But the camp experience, like maybe my younger, if I had, I would have loved to have gone to Jeanette earlier. Because it seemed like more you know, opportunities. But the camp experience, yeah, we got informally, you know, not like in Jeanette where it showed that film where everyone sat there and talked, you know, about it was just informal. Well, what do you want to do? What are you going to do? Right. Um, so I, I really understand that. For me, uh, I wouldn't take a lot you. I felt Corolla was very able body focus. Um, you know, if you need help, you ask a counselor. I can ask with more people. Children 
you were in the cab and all this crap. And then when you met Sherry Green, you was like this poor air person. And he had a younger brother, Jen, who um, also started to work at camp. I remember thinking, well, it's the course to get married and raise two kids and the course were so significantly disabled that I probably am, but I thought, well, maybe I can do it too because I was already helping people in feeding people, I became a counselor and man I got summer and I was doing things that I never expected I'd be able to do. You shall you may be you may need well maybe I could be a mother one day. Mm. So it sounds to me like you know peer support uh was something that was important at Jeanette and other places. I want to know from all of you, how did it feel to be a part of Crip Camp? Lionel. For 50 years, all of us have been telling people about the experience at Jeanette. For 50 years, you say, you know what, when I was a, I, that was a time I worked at this place and there was this place called Jeanette and it did this and we did that. It was one of the, that point in your life when you realize, I think somebody in the camp said, come to Jeanette and find yourself. Yeah, hey, Ellen. And yeah, we all found ourselves there. We found out that there was something much bigger and better and something that was expected of us at that camp. So when we, for, for a long time, I've been in touch with a lot of you. Uh, Judy, I called you a few times in Washington, D.C. I found your, I got your number after meeting a visually impaired woman in Philadelphia. I was in Philadelphia doing work. I, I have a limousine business and I had a contract in Philly to, for a conference. And I'm driving this visually impaired woman to Washington. And I asked her, I said, do you by chance know Judy Human? She liked to flip. How do you know Judy? And I said, <laughs> I made a joke about um, about the two of us back at camp. <laughs> I, I said, uh, we shared some um, Toki Loki back in the dopey dopey days <laughs> at camp. Now, for those who are offended, back in 1969 and 1970, people smoked marijuana. And if you were a counselor at the camp, you did, in fact, go behind the buildings or sit on your porch and smoke a joint or two. So I told her that I'd smoked the joint with Judy and she was a, oh, oh, I can't believe that. But anyway, if, if she called you and I got your number, and I was in touch with you. Uh, I've, I've been in touch with Jack Yuckelman and Larry Allison and Sheldon Coy and Steve Hannesbaum, who was my roommate in New York for a while. And, and so many others, uh, uh, Roberta Trotter. Uh, she lived around the corner from me when I moved to New York. So um, 
I forgot the question running my mouth. Yeah, the question was, <laughs> how did you feel about being a part of the film? Oh, and so it felt the, great. The film, the film gave us a chance to tell the story, and and I had no clue. But this is the thing: I knew about the camp. I knew about the demonstrations in New York because I, I once drove a van with some of the participants in the demonstrations in New York. I know that the first few demonstrations were unsuccessful because the police told the person who put the wheelchairs in the street, you get that wheelchair out of the street and that's what you did. I learned that, and you all learned how to get in front of traffic and not have anyone to get you out of traffic. That's how the demonstration was successful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because so the you police, saw the film for you. Yeah. You feel good about being in that film. Oh, without a doubt, the film, yeah. The film gave us a, an opportunity to tell the tell our story, but it also enlightened us about a story that we didn't know. For those of us on the East Coast, we didn't know about what happened in San California. Francisco. Right. So, Denise, how did it feel for you to be a part of this film? I wish I can't. I can't. And I before it was a and I talking a bad and you took a bad with another your I and you become an and you get so excited because you both had a shared experience and that's what happened with Jen and me and so he helps her at that time. I wanted to make a film about him. And I think that I could be known, but I think that the decision, the decision that he moved when we started, I did that, and I said, yes, yes, because I felt that way too, which is how I ended up interviewing Rodney. I was saying when I was working on the Oral History Project about the disabled, the disability rights movement, I told my supervisor we have to interview Larry. I can't even put it into words, but I knew it was a crucial. He was a crucial figure in bringing me together. And so the 
voice over that you hear which Larry is from my interview with That's great information. So Anne, how did you feel being a part of the film? And when you first saw it, what was your thought about how you looked in the film? Oh my God. What I first of all, I felt really good about being a part of the film. Uh, you know, at first I'm like, well, I went there four weeks. What can I say? Well, how could I add to this? But I think Jim and Nicole's um as interviewers were great at pulling out, you know, really um, you know, interesting parts of people's stories. Um I I felt really um and now I just feel so proud. I mean, I went to a doctor's appointment. I had three strangers say to me, hey, movie star, I saw you in that. And someone else said something like that. Oh, my God, I saw you in that. And I'm always like, well, don't blink. You know, mm -hmm. I was in it a little bit. But I, 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 um, I've had three people um, from my past find me. You know, I went to college, remember me, you know, who, you know, often through dread it, you know. Then I get emails from Jared of saying, this person's looking for you. This person's looking for you. So I let three people do that. Um, when um, I saw the film at Sundance, um, I, um, I just cried and I, I was um, blown away. I was totally blown away by, by what was put together by Nicole and Jim I, and, and all of the production people. I was so... Um, blown away yeah I saw like once a, a bit of it I'm like oh this is looking good but the, the when it was finished um I was and very proud to be a part of it and um it was great you know it was a real trip down memory lane that's for sure mm -hmm. but I a lot of memories a lot of good memories of people there who are no longer with us I want to thank all of you um, well, Julie, yes can I say something? We learn more about you in the film. And, and what we learn is that, what we learn about your, you as a little girl at the beginning of the film and how determined your mother, Mrs. Human was to make sure that uh, there was a fight in your mom and that fight was passed on to you. And what we saw in you, we learned more about you. And I am proud to say that I'm so, proud of everything that you were brave enough to do yes because, because it took more than a notion to do what you did and to stand up and not be a fire hazard anymore mm -hmm. i've read your book and I, I learned even more about you so i i tell people when they see the film i said i'm in it but there's a lady there that and i'm not blowing smoke you are for this movement, what Rosa Parks was for that bus thing and for the uh, bus boycotts in Montgomery. And if if you really, and, and somebody's going to say I'm sexist, but the civil rights movement and the disability rights movement, both were significantly led and influenced by women. Mm. Okay? And if I, Thank you. can I say, I know you're done, and, but you could whatever. I I so agree with you, Lionel. And you know, when when people talk about the film, they're like uh, people I know. The focus is on you. There's yeah. such strong focus on you. I mean, of course, they talk about the camp and like whatever. Absolutely, absolutely. But the focus is, you know, on on you know, the demonstrations and the, you, you and know, my, my thank uncle, you, thank you, thank you, uncle. My <laughs> uncle always says, elderly uncle says, that Judy, every time I mention something about being pissed off about something, he goes, well, talk to Judy about it. He's still doing that. So I agree with you, Lionel. Um, people yes. love the film. And they also, they say so much. I don't know if you guys have heard this. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I think is very important about the film. I agree. And I think all of us in the film uh, demonstrate, 
different parts of our movement. And I think that's really part of the beauty of the film, that the film really allows people starting off at Jeanette, you know, one of the issues that people are very impressed with is the ability for people to sit together and listen to people who may not speak as typically as others, but valuing the individual voices and words of other people. Yes. To me, that was a very critical part of it. And one of the aspects of the film that I really liked was um, Denise's words and the way Denise um, is so powerful and funny oh, yes. with your words, Denise. And I think you bring a dimension to the film that goes beyond the film. And I think, you know, when people talk about they didn't know the story, they didn't know the totality of the story. And so that's one thing that I think is important. But let me just say thank you all very much for this. We could do this for many hours and quite <coughs> frankly for many days because there's so many things we would like to discuss. I hope for those of you who have not yet seen Crip Camp that you do look at it. You can find it on Netflix or on YouTube. And I'm so thankful for Jimmy and Nicole and Sarah Boulder who really put their blood into this film in a positive way. Yes. Thank you all and keep talking and keep making this movement go forward. History won't forget us or try to minimize our pain. And so why are 